Oliver Cromwell was the person who went down in history as the man who killed a king. After the execution of King Charles I, Cromwell became a Lord Protector and led the Commonwealth of England. The only period in the whole history of the United Kingdom, when a Republican government existed under dictatorship and it lasted 11 years. So, yeah Cromwell is a famous man, but what do we know about his children and what was their life? Did they take on after their famous dad? Cromwell married Elizabeth Pchior on the 22nd of August 1620. The couple had nine children, five boys, Robert, Oliver, Richard, Henry and James, and four girls, Bridget, Elizabeth, Mary and Francis. Of the couple's nine children, three sons died young, their firstborn child Robert, who was born in 1621, and died 1639, died in his late teens, their second-born child Oliver, who was born in 1623, and died 1644, who fought for Parliament as a junior officer in the opening stages of the Civil War, died young and unmarried of natural causes, perhaps smallpox, while serving in the garrison at Newport Pagnell, as well as James, their youngest son, born and died 1632, who died in infancy. With the early deaths of his two elder brothers, Richard, born 1626, became the eldest surviving son and therefore heir of Oliver. After long negotiations, in May 1649 he married Dorothy, daughter of Richard Major. Richard and his new wife lived with his in-laws, not far from Winchester, and Richard became a Hampshire country gentleman, serving with his father-in-law as a JP for the county. Over the next ten years he and Dorothy had nine children, only four of whom survived into adulthood. In the early 1650s Oliver Cromwell was concerned about his son's lifestyle, since it's known that Richard was in debt and he have had money worries for much of his adult life. He served in his father's two protectorate parliaments. While he had not been seen as a likely successor to his father under the elective protectorship established by the Instrument of Government of December 1653, the revised Constitution of Summer 1657 empowered and required Oliver Cromwell to nominate his successor and eyes began to turn to Richard. Although doubts have been cast on the precise circumstances and sequence of events, it seems likely that during the last days of his life, Oliver did nominate Richard as his successor, orally if not in writing. In practice, Richard succeeded his father as Lord Protector in September 1658 smoothly and without serious opposition. As Protector, Richard proved himself to be diligent and hardworking, capable of clear and effective speeches, and he was able for a time to charm and to diffuse potential opponents. But his protectorate was beset by very serious problems, he inherited a very weak financial position, because he had no military pedigree or background of fighting for the godly cause he was distrusted by many, especially in the army, and he seemed inclined to support and favor civilian politicians and their cost-cutting measures which might further undermine the army's position and when in spring 1659 he allowed the anti-army elements within his single protectorate parliament to seek to reduce the size and independence of the army. He was unable to survive the military backlash. He was forced to dissolve his protectorate parliament on the 22nd of April and then he wrote or at least signed a letter dated the 25th of May, resigning his protectorship. Fearing harassment from creditors, he was heavily in debt, as much as from the returning Stuart regime, in July 1660 he took boat from the south coast and crossed to the continent. For twenty years he lived a solitary and quiet life on the continent, mainly in and around Paris. Although by the 1670s he was in regular correspondence with members of his family in England, he did not come back, even when he heard news of his wife's serious illness, she died in 1676. In 1680 or 1681 he did at last quietly return to England, living inconspicuously and under a variety of assumed names not at Hursley, his old home, though he visited from time to time but as a lodger in various other houses. In 1706, following the death without children the previous year of his only son, 
he was involved in a legal struggle with his surviving daughters for control of the Hursley estate. He emerged victorious, but continued to reside not at Hursley itself but as a lodger at Cheshunt and there, in July 1712, he died. His body was returned to Hursley Church for burial beside his wife, Henry, the younger of Oliver's two sons who survived well into adulthood, born 1628, by 1647 was serving as a captain in Thomas Harrison's horse regiment. In late 1649 he was promoted to colonel and given command of his own horse regiment, which campaigned extensively in southern and western Ireland from February 1650. Henry returned to England late in 1652. In May 1653 he married Elizabeth, eldest daughter of Sir Francis Russell, a friend and comrade in arms of Oliver Cromwell. Between 1654 and 1667 the couple had seven children, all but one of whom survived into adulthood. In March 1654, soon after his father became Lord Protector, Henry was dispatched on a brief mission back to Ireland, to gauge and report on the loyalty of the English army stationed there. He represented Cambridge University in the first Protectorate Parliament of 1654-55 and again appears to have been quite active in the House. Early in 1655, on the advice of the Protectoral Council, the Protector appointed Henry a member of the Irish Council of State and Commander-in-Chief of the English Army in Ireland. He and his family landed in Dublin in July 1655 and in September he effectively became chief administrator of Ireland. He provided a period of stability, during which there were signs of economic and commercial recovery, and he strove to win support for the protectoral regime amongst the entire Protestant community in Ireland, even those who had supported the king. He re-established the traditional central and regional judicial systems in Ireland, sought to establish a new church organization in Ireland based upon broadly Presbyterian lines and tried to improve the financial and material standing of the Protestant church in Ireland. On the other hand, he did not really engage with the majority Catholic population, making no real attempt either to extirpate Catholicism by force or to win over Catholics by persuasion, ambitious plans to improve educational provision in Ireland came to naught and he was repeatedly stymied by the financial weakness of the English regime in Ireland. He warmly supported his brother's appointment as protector in September 1658, though he soon began requesting permission to leave Ireland and to return to England, both on account of his poor health and, in order to be on hand to advise and support his brother. Nothing came of these requests and Henry was still running Ireland when he heard news of the coup against his brother in May 1659. When it became clear that neither Richard nor any other force would actively oppose the change of regime, Henry, too, bowed to events and, unable or unwilling to call upon his allies in Ireland to fight for the protectorate, he offered his resignation to the restored Rump. He left Ireland in late June and, Having reported on Irish affairs to the Rump's Council of State, he retired with his family to his father-in-law's seat. At the Restoration, he actively petitioned the King, stressing his kind treatment of former Royalists during the 1650s and his loyalty to Charles II, and he lobbied his Royalist friends to put in a good word for him. In fact, he was not seriously troubled by the new regime and, although he lost some of his lands, he retained considerable property both in England and Ireland. Henry died in March 1674. His widow, who survived him by 13 years, was buried by his side. What did you know about Cromwell's children before this video? Let us know in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe to Fun Facts History channel and ring the bell to be notified for more informative videos. Thank you for watching.